If you were put in charge of building America's next air superiority fighter, an aircraft that could outperform even the F-22 Raptor and dominate the skies for decades to come, what types of systems would you put in it? Last week, we discussed how to make this fighter the stealthiest jet ever. This week, we'll talk about how to make it the deadliest. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is Air Power. Before we get started, I want to take a minute to credit Rodrigo Avella one more time for the incredible artwork we used in the write-up for this story and in the thumbnail for this video. Rodrigo also did the artwork for my cover on Popular Mechanics last summer, and he just does some incredible stuff. Make sure to give him a follow on Twitter and Instagram, I'll include links in the description below. I also want to make sure you know that this is sort of a part two to a video we did last week on how to make the stealthiest fighter ever. Now we're going to be talking about the avionics systems and some of the other incredible tech that you could cram into the fuselage of America's next generation fighters. But again, it's important to remember that this is hypothetical. I'll be drawing from real programs and real technology, but when it comes to some of this tech, there's no way to know if it'll be included in America's Next Generation Air Dominance, or FAXX, fighters. But if the DoD's smart, a lot of it will be. And where better to start than with radar, because our next generation fighter will be rocking a multifunction radio frequency system similar to the one being developed for Tempest by the UK. Right now, it's commonly accepted that Northrop Grumman's AN-APG-81 Active Electronically Scanned Radar Array, or AESA, fire control radar systems are the best in the world. They're the same systems you'll find right now in the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter. Now, this radar system gives the F-35 absolutely unmatched situational awareness, but importantly, it's also got the power to be leveraged as part of an electronic warfare suite. That means the F-35 is the only attack aircraft in America's arsenal that can actually do its own AW operations. But as capable as the F-35's AESA radar is, a new system being developed in cooperation between the UK and Japan for each of their respective sixth generation fighter programs promises to blow even its capabilities out of the water. Like existing AESA radars that replaced the nose-mounted radar dishes we used to find in fighters with hundreds of small radar modules, this new system, being developed under the name Jaguar, is expected to increase the number of processors per module, while also reducing signal degradation by converting incoming signals into data closer to the point of reception. Now that sentence may be a mouthful, but it's also a big deal. What that really means is that this system will be able to absorb and process as much as 10,000 times more data than existing radar systems. In fact, according to claims made by the Royal Air Force in 2020, this system would process so much data per second that it could manage the internet usage of an entire city. But a new radar system alone wouldn't quite be enough. Our next generation air superiority fighter will also need an improved distributed aperture system for even better situational awareness. The F-35 Joint Strike Fighter's AN-AAQ-37 Electro-Optical Distributed Aperture System consists of six high-resolution infrared sensors that are mounted at different places on the airframe to provide a complete 360-degree view of the battle space. This system can identify and track other aircraft in the area, incoming missiles, and even allow the pilot to look through the fighter using his or her helmet-mounted viewing system during nighttime operations. In 2018, Raytheon took over production of the ANAAQ-37 system from Northrop Grumman, providing even better image fidelity and stitching together of the different feeds. And the next generation fighter would need to go even further in this direction. 
There are no current publicly disclosed programs to develop an improved DAS system, but because it's been four years since the last update, it stands to reason that improved computing power or sensor construction could provide a new fighter with even better situational awareness than we can find in the current quarterback of the sky, F-35. But even with these incredible systems on board, it's only a matter of time before technology outpaces our new fighter. And that's why it would need to be developed with a modular approach to both software and hardware architecture. Now, when I say modular, what I mean is designed to have components removed and replaced. And in doing so, we can make sure that this new fighter can be updated more frequently and with less expense than current fighter designs. Now, that modular design architecture would allow for updates in components within the aircraft, but we also have to make sure that the software is designed to accommodate these changes in order to fully benefit from this modular construction approach. That issue was touched upon by Air Force Chief of Staff General C.Q. Brown just about two weeks ago when he highlighted how the NGAD's mission systems will be completely independent from the aircraft's flight control software. In older generation fighters like the F-16 he used to fly, flight control systems and mission systems were intertwined. And that meant any change to mission systems would require expensive and lengthy testing of the flight systems to ensure that those changes didn't compromise the aircraft's safety or its combat capabilities. By separating these two systems, changes can be made to the aircraft's mission systems without having any effect at all on the aircraft's basic functions. This modular approach to hardware and software will allow for the rapid fielding of new technologies developed by a wider variety of firms. As long as the new gear meets the standard requirements for fit and operation, it can go in. But now let's move on to the drone wingman, because it's long been understood that the NGAD program isn't working to field a single aircraft at all, but rather a quote, family of systems that will include support UAVs or unmanned aerial vehicles. Now, low-cost or attritable drones like the XQ-58A Valkyrie could really prove effective in this role. They're super cheap, like the cost of a single Tomahawk cruise missile. But I'd be more inclined to lean into statements made by Frank Kendall earlier this year. He's the Secretary of the Air Force, and he recently claimed that the target price point for the NGAD and the B-21's drone wingmen would be at around half the cost of the crewed aircraft. With cost estimates currently sitting at around $200 million per fighter for the NGAD, that sets the drone unit cost at around $100 million each. Now, $100 million is notably more than the cost of an F-35A today, which means these support aircraft should be able to offer similar stealth capabilities to America's existing fighters without going over budget. These drones should share as many commonalities as possible in terms of control systems and body components in the interest of keeping production and maintenance costs low, while still offering very different payloads. In fact, I would argue that we would need at least three iterations of these drone wingmen, with a design for each of these specialties. One specifically for air combat, one for surface combat, and another for sensor reach and electronic warfare. Now, the air combat drone would need to be armed similarly to the aircraft itself, likely with a combination of Lockheed Martin's in-development AIM-260 long-range air-to-air missile or the Raytheon long-range engagement weapon, alongside a number of Raytheon Peregrine missiles. Peregrines are much cheaper and occupy way less space than the existing AIM-9Xs that are currently in service, while offering similar capabilities. That means we could carry more of these missiles and get effectively the same performance. The surface combat drone would need to carry a wide variety of air-to-ground and anti-ship munitions, including the AGM-179 JAGM, the new AARGMER radar hunting missile, and the AGM-158C long-range anti-ship missile, just to name a few. 
And then our sensor and EW drone would carry the ANAPG-81 active electronically scanned radar array that you can currently find in the F-35, as well as some hardware from the next generation jammer pods that are being developed for the EA-18G Growler for electronic warfare duties. If it proves too expensive or too heavy to equip the air and surface combat drones with their own ANAPG-81 radars, Raytheon's much lighter and cheaper gallium nitride-based AESA would make for a suitable stand-in. Including fire control radar in each drone would be feasible at the high price point we were discussing, and it would ensure mission accomplishment even if some drones were lost in combat along the way. Different specialized designs would allow pilots to change loadouts for a mission by simply swapping paired drones, adding air combat, ground combat, or EW capabilities as necessary based on mission parameters. These drones would take their cues from the pilots using a system like Skyborg or something similar, while leveraging artificial intelligence like that being designed by DARPA's ACE program to execute complex commands received through an encrypted data link with the pilot. And that all brings us to countermeasures, which would include both directed energy and holographic systems. It's not entirely clear whether or not new adaptive cycle engines can provide the necessary power for advanced aircraft countermeasures like the ones we're about to discuss, but it seems all but certain that these technologies are bound for airborne applications in the not-too-distant future. Even with improved stealth, our new fighter will still face threats from enemy missiles, whether fired by other aircraft or by ground-based launchers, especially as more advanced multi-static radars and infrared-seeking weapons continue to come online. In order to ensure survivability in the contested airspace over a 21st century battle zone, America's new fighter will need advanced countermeasures to bolster the latest chaff and flare systems already in use. The first of these systems may well be directed energy weapons, or lasers, that can superheat inbound missiles until they detonate or are too damaged to close with their targets. These systems have been under development for literally decades, and the Air Force Research Laboratory's Self-Protect High Energy Laser Demonstrator, or SHIELD, program is probably the most likely option for our fighter. It successfully downed a number of air-launched missiles during ground testing in 2019, and it's expected to begin flight testing in 2024. The SHIELD effort has been focused on pod-contained laser defense systems, but our system would be integrated into the fuselage of the fighter itself. But lasers wouldn't be the only missile defense system. Another lesser-known system that could come standard in our new fighter comes in the form of a 2018 Navy patent with the notably unsexy title System and Method for Laser-Induced Plasma for Infrared Homing Missile Countermeasures. This technology sounds lame, but it is not. It projects laser-induced plasma filaments, which are effectively plasma holograms that can reproduce the infrared signature of an aircraft hundreds of meters away which would confuse any inbound heat-seeking missiles. Although this patent was filed four years ago, it is important to know that there are no current publicly disclosed efforts to develop and field this system for a fighter application. But because this technology has already been demonstrated in small scale, it seems feasible for a classified program aiming for service within the coming decade or so. Now, if you've made it all the way through this video, especially if you've made it through this one and the last one, you're probably well aware of two things by now. The first is that there is a lot of work that goes into designing and fielding a new tactical aircraft, and the second is that it's pretty much impossible to summarize all that work in two videos unless you paint with some very broad strokes and assume the audience knows a great deal about aviation. This is not an entry-level video by any means. But as tough as it may be to summarize all this technology, the real takeaway here is that we're on the precipice of a new golden age in military aviation, with some absolutely mind-boggling platforms entering service within the next decade or two. It's gonna be a very exciting time for AV geeks like me, and probably AV geeks like you if you've made it through this video. And on that ends yet another edition of Air Power from Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. 
Make sure you swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, make sure to click like and subscribe down below and leave me a comment so I know what I should cover next. And of course, don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.